Welcome, world language teachers. We are here to learn more about how to use even more target language in our classrooms. I'm here with Angie, the one and only who is famous for how well she uses target language in her classroom. Angie, can you tell us a little bit more about your classroom experience and how you got so good at using target language? Well, um, I taught for 31 years. I think I actually went out the gate speaking a little too much of the target language because I had done so much research about how one learns a language and um, I had to tone it down uh, in level one so that I, I could make it comprehensible instead of immersion, you know, where all they heard was brrr. Uh, so uh, I spent, before I even became a teacher, I spent years in the library uh, looking up how I'm a nerd, so how, how does one learn a, a second language, or I found out you acquire it, and mm -hmm. so uh, I was equipped with that right off, right off the bat, so um, I first started teaching French, so I, I never really struggled with trying to stay in the target language, I think it just took me a while to be in touch with my students mm -hmm. and realize uh, whether it was comprehensible or not and whether they were catching it. So um, I think for me, the journey was, how can I make this comprehensible? So I spent, I spent most of my career trying to find resources. It's really, the one that I think two things really surprised me when I was a new teacher. One was administrators are never in my classroom. Why not? That was the first surprise. And the second surprise was I have to get these guys from Ola to holding a conversation with me, but I don't have the resources. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, that was, a, that was such a shock. They expect me to complete this task to, to bring students to proficiency, but they don't give me the tools that I need. So that's why I started creating all of the resources so that I'd have all the visuals and all of the tools uh, that, so, so students could understand. I mean, you can't just get up in front of a class and start talking like a history teacher because they don't, they don't speak the language that you speak. So, um, so you know, you, you don't just teach, correct, and go home. Like most teachers, you know, you have to spend an eternity, just tons and tons of time creating resources so that you can talk to students and they'll understand you. So, so I, I was a 12 hour a day teacher. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of teachers can relate to that too. I know I was like that my first two years teaching and I was doing that in a really ineffective method because I wasn't aware that there was a better way to do teaching a language than the one that I was shown by most of the language teaching that I had experienced, right? And I'm sure that you probably had something similar. Like most teachers don't see a 90% or an even immersion style classroom before they go into the classroom. And so we don't really have a lot of models out there as to what it looks like, and we have to figure it out ourselves often. And then there's also the huge resource gap. And so I think a lot of people can relate to that. I've got to do a lot of this work on my own, trying to figure out, A, how I'm going to do this and what I'm going to use in order to get there. So how did you get over that, that hump in your career of figuring out how you were going to do all of this, this huge task of trying to get students to proficiency and figuring out how students were going to understand what you were saying with all these other things you got to do as a teacher too. That's interesting. I never thought about what you just said about how I had never observed that uh, before having to do it. Um, I just worked, I was, I was a workaholic. I just, uh, well, gee, they need visuals. I need to create PowerPoints with visuals. So I would spend a month on uh, one PowerPoint, one vocabulary PowerPoint, uh, because really it takes forever to find just the right uh, visual. And I mean, in order to have the visual be engaging, it has to be artistic, mm -hmm. uh, but it also has to convey exactly what you want. I mean, if they look at that, do they see mother? You know, if, and I've even tested my PowerPoints out on non speakers, the speakers that they don't speak a word of Spanish or French. And okay, what's that uh, nurse? Uh, what's that um, hairdresser? You know, so and, and most of the time, the, the uh, visual that I chose represents the word that I want them to see. So I mean, just just I, I worked. Uh, you know, I guess 
what I want is other teachers not to have to do that, not mm -hmm. have to work 12 hour days to come up with the resources. I want them to go, okay, I have to teach students how to describe clothing. So here's this perfect PowerPoint that Angie spent a month on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I only have to pay $4 for it. So is, what's my time worth? You know, so I want other teachers to be able to teach correct and go home because I didn't get to see these bags. That's 12 hour days for 31 years, you know? So it was just working and then videos. Uh, I don't want to talk about that now because I'm going to talk about it later and I don't want to repeat myself. But when I first started teaching, there were no videos and really there really aren't except for Senor Woolley, um, there aren't any videos for younger learners and his are not native speakers. So um, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It helps. It's, I mean, that's where a lot of the teachers actually fill in that gap is usually people are filling it in themselves or they're going to an expert like you in order to find the resources that they need, right? <laughs> so in your classroom, what does that using that resource usually look like? Like, can you tell us about what some of those daily routines are? How do you interact with students using that those resources? Like, How do you get people to engage with them in with structure how can other teachers do that too okay um so are you asking me what does my daily structure look like yeah what does your daily structure look like with all those resources that you talked about with the resources okay well um i i, I have a daily structure and i do the same thing every day so that students know what i'm saying that's one of the ways that i get to the target language it's that's like a really good idea so, so the first thing i do is bell work they know that and that usually has, well, not usually, but often it has visuals on it. Um, describe this, this visual or answer the question. Um, and then uh, we go over the homework, which, uh, and I put all the answers on the overhead. And, um, and, and then, uh, then I teach, check for understanding, practice, and, and do the closure. But for, uh, let's say I want, a, pick, a, pick a topic. And then I'll, then I'll tell you what resources I use. Hmm. Right now, I'm teaching with my French ones. We're learning about activities and how to invite somebody to go somewhere. So, oh, to really? Mm -hmm. To invite someone to go somewhere. Uh, like doing yeah. things with your friends and like places around town and activities to do. Okay, so places. So I have a, a, I would show, first I would show um, the places uh, PowerPoint and it has beautiful photographs. So you, oh, okay, that's a bank, you know, and oh, that's a theater. And, um, and I would have them um, repeat after me and then I would have it in context. I'd have it in a sentence. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, and then uh, after, six or seven slides, I check for understanding. Um, pues, uh, ¿es un banco o es un, un, una iglesia? Uh, and then maybe in context, uh, ¿a dónde vas para comer? Um, and then the answer, And that, but they're answering it, there's a picture up there, you know, ¿a dónde vas? Um, I'm trying to remember that, yeah. So, right, in that PowerPoint, there are a lot of questions, like, so six or seven slides, check for understanding, six or seven slides, check for understanding, all with photographs. A donde vas para uh, estudiar? And, and, um, and then they'll have a little practice, maybe an interactive notebook, I, I, inter activity. I, I love those because they're hands-on. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want students just passively looking at the PowerPoint. I want them interacting in some way. Uh, so we do a few, they use their whiteboards um, for the check for understanding. Um, they, they work on their interactive notebook, and then um, maybe we'll do a practice, and then a competition um, at the end, I don't leave us. And then uh, I, I wanna give them a lot of input before I have them produce. So they probably wouldn't produce for a couple of days. I wouldn't do the parrot activity until maybe I'll do a little um, TPR story after that uh, uh, with uh, someone who's going places. And then maybe a video after that. I don't have a video on places, uh, but uh, 
And I always end with uh, some kind of competition. I don't know if I answered your question about how how I use, I'm just, uh, uh, I use a lot of PowerPoints for visuals and uh, TPR, we acted out, like we'd act out a bank and um, church and school. um, So. It sounds like fun. It sounds like you have like a really good order that you have with your students. Um, When you first started working with more target language, what was a fear that you had going into the classroom and what was something that helped you get over that? I actually didn't have any fears at first. I was a very arrogant little uh, snot when I started teaching. I thought I knew it all. (laughs) Seriously, because like I told you, I'm a nerd and um, I had done all of that. By the time I got to the methods class, I could have taught it. You know, it's like, why am I taking this class? I already did all this research. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it really uh, it took me a while to get humbled and realize it takes your whole career to learn how to be a good teacher and how to engage students. Uh, but, I, you know, I knew I had the knowledge that if I use English, I'm making it harder for them, uh, not easier. Good. Yeah, because the highest level, the high, highest skill level is translation. So if I make them go back and forth from Spanish to English or French to English, that, that's a skill I don't even have. I want to keep them in one track, uh, thinking in one language at a time. I can't think in two languages at a time. If, I have to, if I'm speaking in this language and I have to say something in this language, I have to hop all of, all, I have to change channels. So um, that knowledge made it easy for me to stay in the target language. When I was a, a, a new teacher, when first five years maybe, I kind of buckled under the pressure of my colleagues and students mm-hmm. to speak English while giving instructions. I went, okay, I'll try it. Um, because I was, for most of my career, I was the only comprehensible input teacher and the only one speaking 90 to 100%. And in the later years, more did, but in the beginning, I was, I was, I was all by myself. And so I got a lot of pressure. So I tried it and I found out students didn't do any better when I gave the instructions in English, because it doesn't matter what language you speak. They're not listening. They will, (laughs) they will watch what you do, but they, they don't hear. So I model everything when I'm giving instructions, I use the target language, but I model it so that, for example, if I want them to, okay, they're gonna work in pairs and I want them to put their desks together and, and, and I want them to put the paper down or the, the images up on their desk and I want, you know, the whole thing. So I'll just model, I'll put two desks together, I'll sit down, explain it in the target language and um, I'll have my partner do what she needs to do. I'll ask the questions. So they're watching and they know exactly what to do. And honestly, um, because 80% of us are visual, most of us hear instructions, wah, 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 wah. you know, I need to see you do it. So um, that, that uh, I don't really struggle to, w- with the notion that I need to use the target language. So to me, that's the easiest thing to do for them. I think it's really important what you said there that for a long time you were the only person who was actually using a lot of target language in your department because I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to. I know I was for a while probably using some of the most target language in my department. Now that I'm a department of one, I think when administrators come into my classroom, they don't really understand what's going on a lot of the time. So a lot of teachers can relate to that and too, and buckling to the pressure of other people to change what you know is going on in your classroom that you can get a lot of conflicting information. Um, What was something that you think really helped when it came to realizing that you know you needed to model directions? What were specific things that you did? I know you said you modeled everything in terms of directions. What really helped it click for kids? Because I know when I do things like that, there are some times where they just, they look at me and they say things like, why can't you just do this in English? Like I sometimes get a lot of pushback even from kids to use more English. Did you ever experience something like that? I did at first. Um, 
Not really very much. Uh, and I actually have a blog post where I, I, I write specifically about how you handle student resistance. Mm -hmm. The reason I don't have a problem with that is because of how I set it up from the beginning. The only people, the only students who complain are students who come from someone else. Um, but uh, I, again, I start out and I say, okay, you know that we're eventually going to go to all Spanish. You know, and so even in level two, well, in level two, if they were all my students, and that has happened, then I just go, I start with all Spanish. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I have my students and other students. So I have to, I have to do, treat the level two students the same way I treat the level one students. Mm -hmm. Except for I, I start after two weeks, maybe three weeks, and then I go to all Spanish. I mean, I'm 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just tell them from the beginning, it's, I set up the expectation. I say, okay, um, we are gonna speak all Spanish or all French. I just want you to know that eventually, but I won't do it till you're ready. So, ah, so then they relax. They don't realize that I think they're ready way before they think they're ready. And I don't tell them when we're gonna do it, but I say, okay, but we're, I won't do it till you're ready, but we're gonna go to all Spanish. I just want you to know that. So everyone, so what I want you to guess what I'm saying. So I, every once in a while I'll stop and I'll say, okay, who can tell me what I said? Mm -hmm. And um, and I want you to guess. I don't care if you're right or not. So I basically um, set up an environment where it's okay to guess, where it's okay to make mistakes. And then when they guess, um, I give them a point. It doesn't matter. Oh, well, good try. Anybody else? Good try. That's what I said. And if Ooh, nobody gets it, really in. I'm going to yeah. start doing that. Yeah. Well, I do that the first uh, maybe three weeks in level one. Um, so I, I would keep practicing. Um, and I, t I tell them, so someone asks me a question, I say, and I'll answer the question. I say, now remember, and I keep telling this, remember, we're going to go to all Spanish. Think, how could you have said that in Spanish? How could you have said that in French? And I tell them how they could say it. And I just keep doing that so they're prepared. And, and um, I give them tools like, now remember, we're going to go to all Spanish. So if you need to say something to me in English, ask me how to say it and I'll give you a point. So uh, I teach them how to say, como se dice? And, and then if you don't understand me, you need to ask what I said. So, uh, que quiere decir? And we practice that and we practice, practice, practice. So I'm basically practicing with them so they have the tools to function in the target language. Um, so then I say, okay, you guys are doing great. See, I spoke. Spanish or French, the, almost the entire period. How many of you understood most of what I said? So, you know, they're starting to gain in confidence. Um, the only time I think students will rebel and say, why can't you just say this in English is if it's not comprehensible input. Mm -hmm. All they're hearing is and they don't understand a word you're saying because you don't have the resources to make it comprehensible to them. Or they got an A in Mrs. So-and-so's class and she spoke English all the time. You know what I'm saying? The A doesn't represent really any, any proficiency whatsoever. It represents that I sat in your class and I took your, your test, but I didn't, I can't speak a word. So I mean, you can't do anything about that. Um, but what I do about that in level two is, um, well, first of all, there those students are surrounded by other students who are holding conversations with me. And so they're going, they're aware how come I don't know what they know? Mm -hmm. um, and so then, we, then after we practice the review for about a month, because you have to when you have other people's students, um, then and and your own students who didn't pay attention and somehow slipped through the cracks, uh, then you give them, then I give them a diagnostic test to see how well you do. And then those who fail, I call home. And the first um, month of Spanish two is a nightmare because I spend a lot of time calling home. But you know. Um, I have to teach in the target language because otherwise I'm I'm do, I'm not, I'm I'm failing your kids. I'm mm -hmm. I'm failing in my responsibility, and so um, I tell the parent, well, you know, they, they took this this review test and they failed, so we need to set them up with a tutor. Otherwise, they won't make it. So that's how I do it in level two. Oh, and I also give points to students whenever they um, speak Spanish to me. I give points to students whenever they answer a question, whether it's correct or not. So um, that's, I don't, I don't really struggle. I don't have that. I don't have, students don't rebel anymore, but I think it's just because 
of the way I build their confidence over time and I prepare them. And I, I, I just set this expectation that in this classroom, there's no English. This is, um, this is the language we speak in this classroom, so. Yeah, I'm sure that students really gain a lot from that. And I know that teachers have got, I've gotten a lot of good ideas from that too. I'm gonna start doing some of those things. Hmm. What activity do you think is real game changer for target language use in your classroom? Uh, yeah, I cannot, can't give you just one. I do know that when I was a new yeah, teacher, go for it. <laughs> when I was a new teacher, um, I was very frustrated that I had a 36 to one teacher student ratio. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, if you have one on one communication, you can learn a language. I tutored a guy 10 minutes a day for two years in French and he became fluent. And but these kids have, uh, they don't have enough interaction time. So I just sat down and racked my brain and said, what can I do to multiply my presence in the classroom so they get more interaction? And I came up with this idea, this stations idea, that's actually student driven. It's eight stations. So uh, you set up like the, the, the um, school, the bank, the gym, eight different stations. And for about two weeks, well, I'm to one station at a time, I'll ask them questions about the stations and they answer. And then for homework, they go and home and they answer the questions. And then we review them the next day. And then I choose the top eight students, excuse me, and they sit in front of their station, and then I choose students. I pair, I put, group them according to ability, about three, two or three at a time, depending on how many are in the class. And they go around and they answer questions. And every time they answer correctly, they get a chip. And every chip is worth a point. And I don't know why they love this. They're speaking for 70 minutes straight in Spanish or French. But they okay. love it. Can we do it again? Can we do it again? And um, the, the good thing is that they're hearing the good students answer because they get to repeat. And so they're practicing. Uh, and I'm just walking around monitoring. So that's the culminating uh, activity I do at the end uh, of class. Um, but during um, all the way through, I would say to for keeping kids in the target language, it's probably the, the TPR stories, telling stories, um, because they love to see how they're going to turn out. And then the question answer and the repetition, they get enough repetition in context. Uh, so that's a, a great resource. And then my favorite comprehensive resource, input resource are videos. Like I said, um, I have over 30 of them. And, you know, I don't know what it is. You stick a, a TV screen around your head and all of a sudden they're paying attention. So <laughs> when I'm uh, telling a story, it's exhausting, right? You're on stage. Who's mm -hmm. watching the students while you're doing that? Um, Cause you can't do everything. So when you're, they're watching a video, first of all, you, they're mesmerized hundred uh, percent student engagement. So now I can watch them while they're watching the video. Right. And the video videos are all native uh, speakers, except for me. I'm in a couple of them and they have subtitles. So if they don't understand what they heard, they can read it. And then I pop in images. So let's say she's saying what Joe in Joe llevo uh, una chaqueta en el invierno. So in the wintertime, you see, oh, it's snowing. There's snow outside. So little pop in images uh, that help them understand. and. Uh, teachers have told me that uh, they speak even they, even though they speak naturally that they're speaking at a uh, at a pace that students understand. So the uh, videos are my favorite uh, tool. Oh, holding real conversations with students. Uh, I would say even if I had a bad lesson, the fact that I'm speaking the target language the entire time that's 90 minutes of exposure to the target language. And so I just hold conversations with them the whole period. So they see this isn't a subject I have to take like it was when I was, you know, in high school. This is this is a this is a communication tool uh, and lots of question and answer. So Yeah, I think it really brings it to life. It makes it really real world skills when you have that conversation with them. That's really powerful. How do you think that you 
have made activities and lessons a game changer for students so that they can talk to each other? What's a really good activity that gets students to talk with each other? Yeah, production. Uh, uh, once once they do that, you know you did a pretty good job with your input. Um, and I try not to have them produce until I've given them that ton of input, but mm. probably um, paired activities and, and group activities uh, are the best. And I try to put a lot of visuals in my paired activities. And uh, I love the paired activities with the um, that are games. So let's see, I have the answer, but you don't. So I'm going to ask you a question. And if you get it right, you get a point. If you don't get it right, then you don't. So because they, they love competition, so that spurs them to speak. And then fun paired activities like speed, uh, speed dating and things like that. And I love dice games because... Yeah, yeah, because it's they're they're looking at the screen and they have the correct they're speaking correctly without trying because the correct qu uh, question is up there and the correct answer is up there and it's just fun and whenever I assign those there's a ton of talking in class. So, you ready for the next one? Sure. How do you create student buy-in for an immersion classroom? I know you talked about how you use the system of points to make them really comfortable around the first three weeks. Mm -hmm. And do you have, what are other strategies that you use? Or is that the main one that you go with? Uh, uh, all of those are important. I also give them um, a list of essential phrases. Like, I know you're gonna have to ask me can I go to the bathroom? I know you're going to have, you're going to ask me, may I use the sharpener? And so I have a long list that I give them and we practice those. And then I test them on that and I tell them, okay, after, after the test, you can no longer say anything on this page to me in English. And so if they do, I just say, como? No entiendo. Cinco pampa. So and they go, what? What? And I'd say, Frash is this. And so after a while, they realize, well, I better keep that on my desk. And the thing is, I think it's really important to realize that it's not the students that you have to train, it's yourself. So because Good. if I am inconsistent and I let them speak to me in English and I respond to them in English, then um, I'm basically setting myself up for student resistance. If I train myself that every time they speak to me in English, I say, no, no entiendo, como? And, you know, and, and then I just keep teaching. Well, what's the consequence? The consequence is that you can't communicate with me. You didn't get your question answered. So if you want to get your question answered, you better figure out how to say it to me in the target language. Mm -hmm. And I talked about the daily routines. Um, oh, the targets. So... Basically, the, the what I described to you about how I set up the expectation that we're going to go all in in the target language, it's kind of like a frog in water, you know, so really, uh, it's like, oh, it's warm and comfortable in here and, and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and pretty soon, you know, it's too hot and the frog gets cooked. Um, <laughs> and they're not going to get cooked, but it's kind of like that. It's like, um, so a little bit at a time and then all of a sudden we're speaking in the target language and they're not even aware that that it happened so that's why that's how i get student buy-in it's it's just the gradual uh, well it's not that gradual but you know just the the system that i use um and then when i do the the targets um every every uh the beginning of every classroom i class i start off and i say well today we're gonna learn so, hoy vamos a aprender, blah, blah, blah. Hoy vamos a estudiar y tal y tal y tal. Y después, ustedes van a blah, blah, blah. Uh, o luego, ustedes van a. Um, so, I do that in Spanish one for about a month and with the English under it. That's what I was talking about, the routines. Mm -hmm. and, then, and I make them repeat after me. Hoy vamos a. And then after a month, I just take them off. They're so used to it. That now it's all in Spanish and it's, it's like, you know, the frog in water. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm afraid I'll forget to say this later, so I'm going to say it now. That's one of the, um, the, the, the uh, strategies I use to stay in the target language. You can't stay in the target language unless students are listening to you. Mm -hmm. So for me, instructional strategies and, and um, 
uh, classroom management strategies, that's number one. I mean, if a teacher tells me, oh, I just can't, you know, I just can't teach in the target language. Uh, I'm like, well, how's your classroom management? You know, how are your instructional strategies? So I start off and I say, okay, this is what you're going to, what we're going to learn. And then this is what you're going to do. So at the very beginning, they know, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to give a presentation. I better pay attention. You know, oh my gosh, there's going to be competition. I'm going to look really stupid if, if I don't know what I'm doing. So I immediately, they're like, okay, I'm with you. And so if they're listening, they're going to be acquiring. But if you don't have their attention, then they're not going to be acquiring. So um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, you hook them right from the beginning, knowing what their task is going to be. And so set us up with the first week of class. And you talked about some of your beginning procedures of what you do. What does the first week look like? exactly for how you set up that target language environment. You talked a lot about how important it is for students to feel safe and comfortable where they feel like they can make mistakes and, and guess. How do you set up that environment so well? And something that maybe other teachers can use too. Um, that's the first two weeks I think are the most important. And yeah. like I said, classroom management, and I spend two or three weeks on classroom management, especially in level one, because if you, if they're not listening, then they're not going to acquire. Mm -hmm. And I'm up there doing a song and dance. And every time I call them, I'm interrupting their social time, you know? <laughs> so, so um, I spend uh, a, a, an enormous amount of time teaching not only the classroom rules, but the classroom procedures. This is how you turn in your homework. Um, this is how you uh, speak. If you want to speak, you raise your hand. We practice when they, when they raise their hand and when, it's, when they answer in chorus. Um, and they know what the, you know, they know what to all those means everybody and um, or this song or whatever. I can't remember what I did. Three years was an eternity. Uh, but so we practice those things. And um, I would say 90 percent of what I know uh, in classroom management for classroom management strategies, I learned from Fred Jones. And mm -hmm. so if any teacher is struggling in, with classroom management. I highly recommend Fred Jones Tools for Teaching Workshops. Uh, I have either attended or facilitated 15 times because there's so much to learn. But um, you, you set your classroom up so that you have an environment that enables you to teach, enables students to learn, then that's, that's a huge hurdle that you don't need to worry about anymore. So I learned proximity from him, um, the, the, the tension part, I learned from him. Um, I, t teaching in little chunks. I mean, after five minutes, most of us here went, 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 went. You know, input, output, input, output. I teach you five or ten minutes at the most, and then you do something with it. Mm -hmm. So I have a word wall. Mm -hmm. I try to set students up with a, they call it text rich environment you know so all the high frequency words are around the classroom and the question words around the classroom so they have quick reference to them um i also always t oh, i forgot i teach the commands first oh, yeah first thing because i want to go eventually i tell them well, i'm going to be telling you what to do i'm going to be giving you all the instructions in spanish or in french if you don't understand what i'm saying you won't be, know what to do right so we're going to practice the commands so the first two or three weeks we're doing commands but it's fun i'll do seven or ten at the most and then we'll have a competition you know first we'll all do them together and then we'll see who can do them faster a side a or side b and then when they get better, we do individual. Um, I'll call a number and see which one of those can obey faster. So basically, and then uh, after we've done this two or three weeks, then after that, I said, well, you know the command. So now from now on, whenever I tell you what to do, it's going to be in the target language. And then th this is after, not this is not the first week, but this is one of my favorite uh, strategies for staying in the target language. Uh, I do this in semester two in Spanish one, but in Spanish two, three, and four, I do it almost immediately, like after the first three weeks, where I'll write Inglés or Anglais, you've heard this, right? On the board, and then every time I hear them speak English, I'll erase a letter. And then yeah. if they have any letters left, they get an extra point on the next quiz. 
And so they could get up to three or four extra points. So they're highly motivated. So this, this helps a lot. That's a great idea. I haven't heard of it done before where you put, you give them bonus points. Oh, my kids would eat that up. I'm gonna have to steal it, that one. It, it really works, uh, it, even with level one. But I, like I said, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't want them to get too frustrated. So they're not quite ready for that until semester two, yeah. in level one. My French twos, we could do that next week though. That's a great idea. I'm gonna try it. I tried the bean thing that didn't work so well. I've, I've tried the bean one before. Yeah, it didn't work well for me. I, I feel like it works well with younger students. Um, oh, interesting. I don't know, but high school, I don't know. They, they're not into it. In my experience, they haven't been into it. Yeah, they weren't into it. And also I was surprised that they, they were too nice. Like they didn't want to take anybody's bean. <sighs> Little angels. Yeah, it's like, no, you're my friend. <laughs> Little angels. Um, what does your class look like in the middle of the year? Like right now we're in February. What does your class look like in February? Like really in the thick of things? That's when I really enjoy teaching because the class is running itself. It's like a well-oiled machine. I cannot be there and still run itself. I mean, I think the first three weeks of teaching are so stressful okay. because you have to do everything. Your students aren't trained yet on the procedures. You don't have TAs yet. If you do have TAs, you haven't trained them. So you're, you're just like, oh, juggling all these balls, you know. But in uh, the middle of the year, the, the TAs are trained. They, um, they hand out all the raffle tickets. Oh, forgot to tell you about the raffle tickets. Ooh, what's the raffle tickets? Well, uh, I'll tell you. Let me finish the, the question. Uh, they hand out all the raffle tickets. Students are walk, walking in and working right away. Um, they're holding conversations with me. They, they, they know the routines. They put their homework in the, in, in the homework basket, you know. So that's what it looks like. But um, one of my uh, – we were talking about how to keep them in the target language, and they can't be in the target language if they can't hear you, and they can't hear you if they're all talking. So um, – this is a strategy that I love and it really works uh, most of the time is uh, incentive where they come in and either a TA or if you don't have a TA, another student whose job it is. That's another thing is in the middle of the year, the students know what their jobs are. You know, some people, kids pass out papers, some kids return homework. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you know, everything's running smoothly. Uh, people know where to pick students know where to pick up homework uh, if they were absent. But anyway, so they come in, if they're sitting quietly, they're not talking and they're writing uh, because the bell works on, on the screen, then they get a ticket. And then on Friday, I have this box and I, I have things from Teachers Discovery, they have incentives and pens, pencils, um, really cute things. They love the bracelets, I don't know why. And then I always put in uh, homework passes and candy bars, uh, chocolate. They love the chocolate, the big ones, the little ones. So um, then I'll shake it up. At the end of class, they put their little tickets in the, in the jar and then I shake it up and I pull four names and they get to get a goodie. So that keeps them coming in and working immediately, so. That is a nice incentive. I like that idea. That's a fun one. Yeah. Could you recommend, what do you think is something that teachers could use tomorrow in class? Something that they could start with right away, no matter what level of target language that they're using that could help bring up their level that they have? The raffle tickets. Yeah. Yeah? That's yeah. a good one. Yeah, the raffle tickets. Um, and probably the tension in the lesson. Today we're going to do this, and then you're going to do this. How can teachers build up more target language use if they want to reach for more than where they are now? Like I know a goal of mine all year has been to use more target language, and I know I'm not quite where I need to be. How do you think teachers can level up their target language use? I think the important thing is to plan, 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 plan. Um, and have all your visuals ready. Like I said before, we we need the resources. And so you have to look at what your what is it you want your students to be able to do today? Um, and will they be able to, will they have the tools to do it? 
uh, will they be able to understand you? If not, how are you going to make them understand you? So uh, make sure you have all your visuals in line. When I look at my lesson plan, I'll say, oh, they're not going to understand that. You know, do I have a visual to help them understand that? Um, have, have visuals in your PowerPoints, um, have your stories ready, have your videos ready. Um, and don't, a mistake that I made as a novice uh, teacher, which was, I guess I was a novice for many, many years, uh, is to assign something and not give students um, the vocabulary they needed to do um, the, the task. So I want them to ask each other questions, but um, they don't know how to, how, how to react. So I have to give them those those, um, well, no me digas, uh, oh, estoy de acuerdo, you know, things like that. And uh, I know some teachers uh, are really surprised and, and indignant that their students would use Google Translate. Well, ask yourself, did they have all of the foundational vocabulary they needed to do that task? And if not, you can expect them to use Google Translate because they want to succeed. So if you don't want them to use Google Translate, then make sure that they have the vocabulary they need. Uh, for instance, when I gave my AP students, now these are AP students, a task to um, uh, find a Spanish, uh, a recipe from a Spanish speaking country, prepare it and explain to the class how you prepared it and then we get to eat it. But you know, I'm not a native speaker and I wasn't raised uh, in a Spanish speaking country. And um, even though I lived in Mexico and in Spain, I did very little cooking. So my knowledge of spices and many uh, foods and utensils uh, is, is minimal. So I made a huge long list and verbs. How do you say um, to um, stir up and how do you say to bake and all those things they need? There's no way they could have done this assignment without a huge bank of verbs and, and vocabulary. Otherwise, they'd all be using uh, Google Translate. So make sure that uh, just you have to be prepared, prepared, prepared. Uh, writing a lesson plan can take hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. um, what can language teachers do to make everything more comprehensible to students? Because you mentioned that sometimes there are some gaps. So what can teachers do to make sure that their language that they're using is comprehensible? Um, I, I'm probably going to repeat myself, but probably just model everything. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you have your visuals, um, high frequency words, uh, uh, use, uh, illustrate everything. Uh, not all my stories are illustrated, but the ones that are work really, really well. It's like I'll be telling the story and they'll be following along in the, in the illustrations. Um, Use realia and objects uh, when you're when you're teaching food. Have objects of food. Uh, I use plastic food. Uh, when I teach the um, the clothing, I go down all the list of what do I want them to know, and I have this huge suitcase and I put all of them in there and I pull them out and I talk about them. Uh, draw on the board, you know, do whatever do whatever it takes to get students to understand, mm -hmm. um, and of course have visuals. Uh, I think uh, in videos, yeah, you got to have those videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, uh, um, I, I pretty much uh, touched on all these things before. Mainly, you have to be prepared. And I, I think, uh, like I said, when I was a new teacher, I was not prepared for how how it, it, how time consuming it was going to be. And I, I was a little mad because before I became a teacher. I was trying to decide what to do with my life. And, and see, you know, I have these languages. What do I do? Well, I could be a flight attendant or I could be a teacher. Turns out, you know, teaching uses all of my talents and what I was doing before used none of them. So I was very bored because I used to be a, an illustrator. Mm. But um, uh, I didn't want to be a flight attendant because I didn't want to be in different countries alone by myself. And, in hotels. Uh, and so I talked to teachers and I interviewed them and not one of them said, this is really time consuming. <laughs> so I think that's a, that was a huge shock to me. It's like, I don't have a life, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, if you really want your students to understand what you're saying, you have to have uh, those resources. So. Very true. 
what are some things that you use to make yourself a better teacher? I know you talked about using Ron Jones. What are some other things that you like? Do you have any book recommendations or podcasts or conferences that you like to go to? Act Phil. Uh, we had one, uh, I, I loved Act Phil. We had uh, flags in Sacramento that I used to go to and um, read, 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 read. I'm, I'm reading a book now in Spanish. Um, in fact, I wrote a, I wrote a blog post on how to stay fluent recently. So if you want to go to um, best PowerPoints for Spanish and um, that's the last uh, blog post I wrote. It says, I think that the best thing you can do to be a teacher, uh, the best teacher you can be is to keep fluent, especially if you're, if you're a native speaker, great. You don't have to work on that, but I never was. So, I mean, I have to, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. So, and so um, I mean, I, I took Italian for a year and I, all I remember is manja because I don't use it anymore. So, um, so keep yourself fluent. Um, I, I've talked to people on, um, I can't remember it, uh, the name of it. I wish I could because it's a really good service. There's two of them. Talk Abroad is one of them. Mm. And there's another one where you pay a very small fee and you can speak to a native speaker and practice oh, that cool. way. And I have a native speaker friend and I visit with her. I just love her and, and uh, we speak in Spanish. Um, and also I'm in many Facebook groups and many um, Instagram groups. I've, I've learned so much by collaborating with other teachers. Mm -hmm. We're so isolated in our classroom and I can't believe I used to think, well, I know it and you guys don't know anything. And we started doing PLCs in my school and I went, wow, that's a really good idea. I never thought of that. You know, you get so many ideas from other people. And uh, I mean, I, I learned from a Facebook group about interactive notebooks and interactive notebook activities. And that totally revolutionized my, my student learning. So, Great. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's amazing. I love learning from other teachers. That's honestly, that's my favorite place to go to. That's why I like doing things like this. I've already learned a lot. What do you do on difficult days, like, oof, hard days to maintain your target language? You know, I don't have a trouble maintaining the target language. I have trouble, uh, I have trouble um, covering the material. Mm. So, you know, when you say difficult days, I think, okay, this is the <laughs> second fire drill this month I mean we'd have them every two weeks whether we needed them or not someone was smoking in the bathroom um or you know homecoming or oh my gosh you've never seen rain before we all have to go to the window and look at the rain you know <laughs> yeah so you just uh, change the homework and teach it tomorrow and go with the flow and turn it into a learning uh, a, turn it into something a teachable moment like oh mm -hmm. please Está granizando, sí, o, o llueve mucho en, en febrero, ¿no? And, you know, just uh, roll with it. Yeah, roll with it. That's the nice part about using lots of target language, right? You can make anything still relevant when you're giving them lots and lots of input. How do you handle any type of tricky classroom management situation when you're in that thick of it working in 100% target language? Yeah, you know, that's... Uh, that's a very good question because uh, it's really hard unless you have uh, this wonderful um, Jerry Seinfeld personality where kids just love you and you're funny, but I'm not very funny. So um, uh, students know right from the beginning when I when I first taught them the rules, they know tienes un aviso, you have a warning, tienes detención, they know that if you do this, this is the consequence, so I don't get much uh, much pushback on that. Uh, oh, oh, what I started to say was that it, it's hard to keep the, the relationship, you know, and then when you're handing down consequences in the target language, um, there can be a little, it can get a little icy. Uh, but uh, most of the time, there isn't a problem, and they even understand, um, you know, go to the office. Uh, but if it's really egregious, I will just, you know, keep teaching because the students are used to me walking around the classroom. I never stay in the same spot. Uh, I mean, unless I'm, you know, formally teaching at, up front. So I'll just walk to the offender and stand by him or her, excuse me, whisper in the ear in Spanish or, or English, French or English, depends um, on the moment. Um, but they usually understand 
go to the other room or go outside or talk to me after class. Um, so I'll just um, say, well, I'll go in the other room or go outside and then get my students working on something and then I'll go talk to them in private and then we'll have a conversation. And th the reason that I do that is twofold. First of all, I want to maintain the integrity of the all Spanish, all target language, all French in this classroom. So I'm not going to have that conversation in English in this classroom. And secondly, it needs to be private. So mm -hmm. I don't want anybody else to know what's going on. This is between the student and me. I don't want to embarrass the student. If I want to have a whole class against me, I will definitely um, come down on the student publicly. So that's how I handle that. Yeah. I think that's a that's a good universal strategy. Any subject, it's always it's always got to be private, right? Yeah, I haven't um, honestly uh, always done that, and so I've suffered the consequences. How do you handle when things flop and students are really lost in translation? I didn't quite understand that question. So when you have a moment where you're you're really getting into the flow of doing things and you can just tell that your students are lost, they don't know what's going on or what you're saying, what they're supposed to do, when basically the target language fails. Um, 90% of the time, I will try another method. I'll say it in a different way. Um, I will act it out. I will draw on the board. Um, I'll do whatever I can to get them to understand. I'll use cognates. Um, if none of that works, uh, let's say it's a difficult grammar concept for two minutes, I'll go to English, but that's rare. Uh, that hardly, hardly ever happens. The only time I go to English and I have found that this is the only, only time the only thing that students cannot understand, actually two times, it, when I'm teaching the direct, op, direct and indirect object pronouns, I realize that they will not understand me because they don't understand English grammar. So I spend about a week teaching them English grammar. And then I show them the difference between the English and the Spanish grammar. Mm -hmm. and, then I, and then I teach it, then I teach them the, their pronouns all in Spanish. Uh, and then imperfect and preterite, they struggle. So I'll spend a little bit of time in English. Apart from that, I haven't found any time that students couldn't understand me. So every, um, except for those two grammar areas, um, if they didn't get, get what I was saying, I would just say it slower or repeat it uh, many times or act it out. Or like I said, I'll do anything I can to get them to understand me. And usually that works. So. That's a good strategy. And how do you design your curriculum with target language use in mind? Um, I think, OK, what is it that I want them to be able to do? And again, plan, plan, plan. Um, what visuals am I going to need so that they will understand what I'm saying? And um, I'm going to direct instruct and then what resources am I going to use so to give them enough repetition and context and a lot of times um, this is an area where I mean if my students aren't producing I'm like how can you not be producing it well obviously I haven't given you enough repetition and context because you're not able to produce yet so uh, I think we have to give them way more than we think we have to give them so we have to plan okay I'm going to teach I'm, I'm not in the um in the, uh, I'm not a purist. I like to blend the conscious mind of learning with the acquisition. So I, I formally teach and then I spend the rest of the time cementing it with comprehensible input. So I have things like, um, let's see, well, this is this would be a good uh, listening activity where they listen and they draw or they listen and they respond or they might want a story. This story might be a good tool for, for this particular concept or a video. So that, that's how I do it. That's kind of a perfect marriage of both of them. 
So you have so many great ideas for what teachers can do in order to use their target language. We've got really great structures for what your classes can look like, awesome routines, really great rewards. I'm definitely going to use that one where you write Anglais on the board and erase it. I'm definitely going to use that next week. Thank you so much for all of these great ideas. And I know that you have so many, you have a ton of like a whole library of blog posts where teachers can find out more about this. Where can teachers find out more about you, Andy? They can also go to my website, um, bestpowerpointsforspanishclass.com. Uh, um, I have a YouTube channel as well. I think that's called Angie Tory. Mm -hmm. um, I have a Facebook uh, group. That's best PowerPoints for Spanish and French. Oh, but you know, probably Instagram is where I talk, I show most about who I am as a person. I post um, frequently about my workouts. It's really important for me to stay in shape. So Instagram is best PowerPoints for Spanish, I think. So if they want to know more about me personally, that's, you want to see my good workouts? Yeah, I post some of my workout stuff on Instagram, too. It's always a fun place to go. We'll make sure that we link to all of those blog posts where teachers can find out more specifically about target language, and they can find you on all of the places all over the Internet to find out more about you. And thank you so much for joining me so that we can learn more about target language and benefit from all of your expertise. Thank you so, Thanks so, so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.